Welcome to Masters and Creators from Frames to Names, the show where we look at creative icons through the ages who influence still impacts the way we tell stories today. Today we're going to be talking about Japan's most influential filmmaker, master of imagination and animation, Studio Ghibli's own Hayao Miyazaki. <laughs> Spirited Away, Howl's Moving Castle, The Wind Rises, they all have two things in common. Number one is they were all nominated for an Academy Award, and number two is this guy, Hayao Miyazaki. In fact, five of the 11 movies this guy has directed are in Japan's top 20 grossing movies of all time. And we're not just talking animation here, we're talking all movies. To give you a bit more context, in Japan, the Titanic made 26 billion yen. Spirited Away made 30 billion yen. That's about a difference of 53 million US dollars. It's because of this success that Miyazaki has become known as the Walt Disney of Japan. But Miyazaki is not just a director, he is a producer, a screenwriter, animator, author, and manga artist. Oftentimes, he'll take up multiple roles in his own productions. Miyazaki's work is known for its varied and three-dimensional female leads, its amazing world building, themes of overpopulation, global warming, and militarism. And most of all, its fantastic creatures. From winged beasts, to moving castles, to demons, to ghosts. If you can think of it, it's probably in a Miyazaki movie somewhere. Miyazaki is one of the few filmmakers in this world that is happy to just let his imagination flow. In fact, by the time they had started work on Spirited Away, the script wasn't even even finished. He did this because he wanted the end to seem really organic. In fact, a large number of Hollywood directors, including the director of Toy Story and A Bug's Life, have said that if they have creative block, they watch one of Miyazaki's movies for inspiration. So Miyazaki was born in January of 1941 in the town of Akebonocho in Tokyo. When he was four years old, he was actually in Utsunomiya when it was bombed. He has said that this has made a lasting impression on him throughout his entire life. By the time he was in middle school, he had already decided he wanted to be a manga artist, but he found that he couldn't draw people. So most of his early work consisted of tanks, planes, war machines, that kind of deal. But he destroyed most of his early work because he thought he was just imitating other artists rather than developing his own style. When he was in high school, he saw Panda and the Magic Serpent, and this is what made him fall in love with animation. But when he was in university, he didn't study art. He actually studied political science and economics, but he did visit his middle school art teacher and sketch with him in his studio. And there they would talk about politics, the economy, pretty much everything. And they would just allow the creative juices to flow. By the time 1963 came about, he was working at Toei Animation. Here he would work on various things as an artist, including Gulliver's Travels Beyond the Moon, Flying Phantom Ship, and the wonderful world of Puss in Boots. He would leave Toei in 1971 and would go on to work on Lupin the Third Part One. He would basically slowly build up his career over the years until eventually he was approached by Animage. Now, Animage was a magazine that was part of Tokuma Shoten, which was a publishing company. This would actually allow him to pitch some ideas for some original animation projects and they would hear his pitches but they wouldn't pick anything up because original animation was a huge risk at the time and they just didn't want to take that risk. But they would allow him to adapt one of his ideas into a manga and that would become Nausicaa the Valley of the Wind. Nausicaa tells the story of a girl who is the princess of the Valley of the Wind living in a post-apocalyptic earth. She gets caught in a struggle with the state of Tolmechia who want to revive a weapon to eradicate these giant mutant bugs but she has the unique ability to hear them and has to stand up for them, as it's her hope that all living creatures can find a way to coexist. The manga ran from 1982 to 1994 and was instantly a hit. The manga has sold over 10 million copies worldwide and spans over 1,000 pages. By the time 1984 came around, Animage turned around to Miyazaki and was like, so about that original animation idea, you want to turn this into a movie? And Miyazaki agreed on the condition that he was allowed to direct this as well. Common misconception is that this movie was made by Studio Ghibli. This was actually made before Studio Ghibli was a thing. This movie was actually animated by a studio called Topcraft because Animage didn't have an animation studio, they were a magazine. 
With the huge success of Nausicaa, Takuma Shoten would fund Miyazaki's next project, the opening of Studio Ghibli. The studio's first film would be Laputa Castle in the Sky, and the majority of the production team that were on Nausicaa would do Castle in the Sky. Laputa follows the story of a girl named Shita who has been abducted by the government of Muska. Through a series of events, she falls from an airship and is saved by the power in her crystal amulet. She meets a boy named Pazu, and the two go off on an adventure to find a legend legendary floating castle. The movie has themes of intrigue and really makes you think about militarism and government control from multiple angles. The movie actually doesn't give any definitive answers to the questions it raises, it just sort of leaves it up for the viewer to decide things for themselves. But I think it's really smart about that, like it doesn't preach to you, it just lets you decide for yourself. This is actually a common thing throughout all of Miyazaki's work, he never gives a definitive answer, he just kind of lets you decide for yourself. Following this, Miyazaki would start work on My Neighbor Totoro, but at the same time the studio was working on Grave of the Fire Flies, and the two were going to be released simultaneously and they had a lot of the same artists and a lot of the same key animators so there was a bunch of confusion going on in the office but the reason the two of them had to come out at the same time was to ensure the financial stability and future of Studio Ghibli. They had to make themselves look profitable and viable to investors. My Neighbor Totoro was released in April 1988 and received critical acclaim and bombed at the box office, but broke more than a profit when it came to merchandise sales. The movie tells the story of two girls named Satsuki and Mei, and how they move into a house to be closer to the hospital that their mother is staying at as she suffers with an unnamed long-term illness. The two girls quickly meet a forest spirit who they name Totoro, and build a relationship with him through various misadventures through the movie. The movie's main theme is about humanity's relationship with nature, and how we could benefit by being more in touch with nature. It also follows the idea that everything has a soul, from a little girl to a tree to your home itself. Fun fact, there is actually a sequel to My Neighbor Totoro, it's only like 15 minutes long and you can only see it at the Studio Ghibli Museum in Japan, and its playtimes are really random so it's really difficult to see, and I don't know anyone that's seen it and I really want to see it myself so I really wish the Studio Ghibli Museum would release a schedule of when it's going to be playing so I can go to Japan just to see this movie. My Neighbor Totoro is actually incredibly personal for me as Zaki, but because much like these kids had to deal with their mother suffering from a long-term illness, his own mother suffered from an illness for nine long years while he was growing up. The next movie Miyazaki would make is Kiki's Delivery Service, which is actually one of my favourite movies of all time. It's definitely my favourite Miyazaki and Studio Ghibli movie. It follows a young witch named Kiki as she moves out for the first time and journeys off to become a town's witch. It's really just like a super chill coming of age story that deals with becoming an adult, becoming a woman, and finding power in your own creativity and finding your own identity in this world. And most of all, it's about using your own creativity as a force that can benefit yourself and others around you. So from the 1970s, Miyazaki have been playing with this idea of a movie that was about a girl that lived in the forest with spirits, but he didn't really have a solid idea for it yet. It wasn't until 1994, after he had directed six movies, that he began to outline the plot and the setting. He really struggled with writer's block, but after seeing the ancient forests in Kyushu, he knew exactly what he wanted to make. And this would become Princess Mononoke. Animation would start in the summer of 1995 and wasn't finished until just a few months before the movie was set to be released, which is cutting it incredibly close for an animation because it really didn't leave any time for anything to be changed. The movie is set around the 16th century and is about the Emishi prince Ashitaka who gets bit by a demon while protecting his village and is in turn cursed. He has to travel west to find a cure and on his adventure he comes between humans that consume a forest resources and the gods of the forest themselves. This movie was way more thematically heavy than any other Miyazaki movie so far. There's like the surface level theme of environmentalism going on, where as humans progress with technology, we damage nature, which in turn hurts us. So are we even making any progress to begin with? It also deals with themes of disability, sexuality, coming of age. There's like an entire list of themes that are in this movie. But it also does kind of state that when it comes to nature versus technology, there is no right or wrong answer, it's not a black or white thing, it's kind of like a grey thing because 
humans couldn't live without technology anymore, not in the way that we live now, so we can't just get rid of it all, but at the same time, we can't keep hurting nature, so there isn't a right or wrong answer. The film would be the highest grossing movie in Japan that year, only being surpassed by the Titanic several months later, and yes, I do see the irony in that statement. The movie would do so well that it will be the first Studio Ghibli movie to get a full theatrical release outside of Japan. It would bomb and it would only make $3 million, but it was very important, like it was a huge step forward. Following this, he would create his masterpiece, Spirited Away, which flawlessly merges themes of Shintoism with the modern world. He would also adapt Howl's Moving Castle, adding themes and messages such as live for yourself and question those with militaristic ambitions, and would even get several Academy Award nominations. And I want to get into more detail right now, but I can't because I just don't have the time. So you're just going to have to tune into next week's episode of Masters and Creators from Frames to Names, where we're going to continue talking about Hayao Miyazaki and Studio Ghibli.